Welcome to our fifth annual Downtown Lecture Series. My name is John Paul Jones. I'm the Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. This series is called Truth and Trust in the Global Scene. And we decided on that name in early spring of this year. And I kept insisting to my colleagues in marketing and communication and outreach that we should just refer to it as chaos. <laughs> uh, they fought me tooth and nail, however, and in the end they won me over by saying, JP, what if everything is calm in October? <laughs> <laughs> no worries about that. <laughs> so we live and learn. So the topics that we'll be discussing uh, this uh, series are weighty and they're controversial and they're timely. And our format is essentially uh, the same for all three, this Wednesday and the next two Thursdays. Uh, we'll have a conversation uh, with a practitioner, a professional, or a problem solver in collaboration with uh, some of SBS's finest uh, teacher scholars. And the topic for tonight's conversation, the future of elections, takes on the important question of the political impasse in this country and the role that political incivility and the culture war and even identitarian politics uh, is playing in the political divide that we face. The questions are essentially, what is it that divides us and um, can we trust our fellow citizens when they go into the ballot box? And perhaps even can we trust the ballot box when we go into the ballot box? <coughs> Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors who make all of this happen. Um, four sponsors that have been with us from the very beginning. First of all, we've always been in the Fox Tucson Theater, this lovely gym in downtown Tucson, and um, it is a, uh, it's great to be back uh, one more season uh, here at the Fox Theater. I'd like to thank Arizona Public Media for their sponsorship, and especially the, the hard work of the people uh, behind that curtain here who are both live streaming to places like Sierra Vista and also recording uh, tonight's uh, event. I'd like to thank the Arizona Daily Star for their continued support of the series. And finally, Tucson Medical Center also have been with us since the very beginning. I'd like to thank, especially tonight, Janos Wilder of Downtown Kitchen and Cocktails and also the University of Arizona Office of Global Initiatives. <clears throat> And not last, all the Magellan Circle donors, contributors, supporters of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences help make uh, not only this event, but all of our outreach events across uh, Southern Arizona possible. And especially tonight, four incredible couples have come together to uh, provide special support for uh, this evening, uh, and in fact, the entire series. I'd like to thank Barbara Starrett and Joanne Ellison, Steve and Nancy Lynn, Linda and Ken Robin, and Drs. Vivi and Adib Sabah. Thank you all very much. When I say they're special people, I mean that I have traveled with these people internationally and you learn a lot about people when you travel with them internationally. If you go to places like Cuba, or Israel, or Palestine, or Mexico, or Turkey, or even Italy, <laughs> you learn a lot about people, and uh, these are four uh, very special couples that are very dear to me. A couple of uh, pieces of uh, information to pass on first. I would like uh, to ask that everyone 
behave yourself because we're being live streamed and recorded. <laughs> behave, you know, is the root to the word behavioral, which happens to be in the title of the college, and I don't know why it is in the title of the college, because we have a very hard time doing that. All right. Uh, secondly, I'd like you to all take out and turn on your cell phones. And no, I'm not joking. Take out and turn on your cell phones and go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and download the app, and you will be able to send questions uh, to our moderator, Christopher Conover, sitting over here, and uh, he will take those uh, towards the end of, the, uh, uh, of tonight's uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, you can type in the code hashtag SBS downtown and type in a question. You can also vote for your favorite question that's posted uh, on the app. Uh, now it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our, our panel tonight. And uh, to the far left is uh, Associate Professor of Communication, Dr. Kate Kensky, who is a specialist in political communication and public opinion. And she has previously served as a senior analyst for the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania. And her a book, uh, that won many awards on the 2008 election called The Obama Victory, How Media, Money, and Message Shaped the 2008 Victory. Sitting next to her is Assistant Professor Samara Klar of the School of Government and Public Policy. And she is an expert on how personal identity and social context shapes political attitudes and behavior. And she is the author of a recent book called Independent Politics, How American Disdain for Parties um, Leads to Political Inaction. And that's also an award-winning book. She also, I should say, is the founder of a fantastic website aimed at uh, transforming the, the voices that are heard at panels such as these. And that, uh, that website is called uh, Women Also Know Stuff. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's great. <laughs> Which is kind of proven by the uh, lineup that we have here tonight on stage. <laughs> yeah, how'd you get here? <laughs> and sitting... <laughs> I'm just going to prove the, the website right. <laughs> Don't worry. The stories that Christopher Conover could tell. <laughs> uh, and sitting next uh, to Samara is uh, Professor uh, Carolyn Lukensmeyer. She is Professor of Practice in the School of Government and Public Policy and also the Executive Director of the National Institute for Civil Discourse in the School of Government and Public Policy, which has offices in both DC and Tucson. She is the, I think, the nation's leading expert on political incivility, um, and we're delighted, uh, we're delighted to have her here. She is very nice, by the way. <laughs> She's the founder and former president of America Speaks, a grassroots uh, organization designed to get Americans to talk to one another, and she's been working in NICD to focus on institutional political incivility at both the national and state levels, and also among young people, and to get them to come together and to address the political dysfunction in this country, and we're delighted to have her as well. And then, um, our moderator is my, uh, my good friend Christopher Conover, uh, who's uh, uh, a good friend of SBS and has helped us with a, um, a large number of events. You'll immediately recognize his voice if you haven't seen him before. <laughs> He's a reporter and producer with Arizona Public Media, where he focuses on uh, the military, uh, politics, uh, and the environment. And he is uh, also an award-winning a journalist having received the Edward R. Murrow Award for Journalistic Excellence. And I'm uh, delighted that he uh, agreed to do this with us tonight. Thank
thank you all for coming, and I'm sure we're going to enjoy ourselves. Christopher? Thanks, JP. And thank you to all of you for uh, coming out here on a cool Tucson evening. <laughs> uh, feels so much like fall outside. We're supposed to be talking about trustworthiness and the election and elections in the future. And trustworthiness is pivotal, or pivotal. But before we get started, let's back up a little. We have three uh, wonderfully smart people here on the stage uh, who I've had the privilege of interviewing, especially Kate, uh, a num for many years. Uh, so you're going to get to listen in on a conversation that I think started over dinner, basically, for all of us. And we're going to allow you to participate. But we want to back up and start with how did we get here? Uh, d and not hear the Fox Theater, but maybe hear the Fox <laughs> Theater. Kate, we've been talking about this type of thing for a long time. Uh, JP mentioned your book on the Obama victory and how media played a role in the 08 election. 2015, you wrote an article about the rise of Twitter. Who knew? And uh, now you have a forthcoming paper on incivility and political identity on the internet. Who knew? How did we get from 08, the first internet president, to where we are now? Well, I think the first thing to keep in mind is that uh, we are very far from 2008. I mean, at that point in time, we thought we were on the cutting edge of what media could do. And we were able to demonstrate through very systematic research about how media um, you know, definitely shapes our attitudes uh, towards candidates and, importantly, what in a given moment um, we decide to do. Uh, one of the things that's important to recognize when we think back about how did we get here is for a very long time, people thought that the media didn't matter so much. And then it shifted to, well, it matters because it affects other people, but it doesn't affect me. A lot of people have that opinion, and yet media still tends to, to shape outcomes. So how did we get to you know, where we are now? Um, part of it has to do with a media environment um, that really has exploited the worst that's in all of us, just, just as humans. Mm -hmm. Every human has a series of limitations when we look at information and how we make judgments. Now, some of those you know, limitations are there for, for really good reasons. They help us in a given moment. But what I would say is that the media environment has exacerbated um, the weaknesses in ourselves, and unfortunately, those weaknesses are resulting in a, a broader societal impact, um, where we, of course, are now at the point where both parties are much further from each other perceptually. They're not finding that common ground, and we have to have some sort of common ground to have a functional representative democracy. Samara, let me come to you, um, and I'll have questions for each of them to start, and then this will become very conversational as we all start interrupting each other. <laughs> but uh, Samara, in, in your new book, Independent Politics, that came out last year, one of the things you wrote about is why so many Americans refrain from identifying with a party label. We seem very red, we seem very blue, but there are an awful lot of folks out there who, who are walking away from both sides. Why? Yeah, I mean, we hate to pile on the media, obviously, Chris. It's not all your fault. <laughs> but I think Kate really raises some really important points that when we, we open the newspaper, we read online, we turn on the TV, what we see is the worst of both parties. We see aggression, a lot of fighting, bickering, and really sort of insurmountable conflict. You know, I had, um, uh, in the course of my research, we analyzed just the phrases that are used by candidates in the course of presidential debates. And if you look over time, the number of sentences that convey this insurmountable conflict between both candidates is increasing exponentially. And the image this gives to people who are watching is that partisans are aggressive people, and none of us want to be associated with that. So I may be a very strong Republican or a very strong Democrat, but I don't want to be associated with all that con on conflict and aggression. So when I'm out, you know, out and about meeting new people and talking about my beliefs, I don't want to associate with my political party because I'm worried about the image that that's going to give off to other people. And of course, Carolyn, we're, we're supposed to be civil. And if we talk, I bet if we took a poll, we brought the house lights up and took a poll, everybody in here would raise their hand and say, yes, we need to be civil. Um, people talk about it, but it sure doesn't seem like it's happening. What are you all seeing? 
Well, I think one of the things that, just to, still with your question about how did we get here, it really is a series of structural issues in our electoral politics. And those structural issues have led to the kind of behavior we're now seeing. And when we look at how people behave, we sometimes stop looking at what are the social structures that people are responding to. So in our electoral politics, it's the issue of gerrymandering. Too many districts are set. It's the issue of too much money in politics. Mm -hmm. It's the issue of the way primaries work now that drive candidates to their base, which is part of why they behave the way Samara just spoke. And it is the social media environment. So you put all that together, and it has created hyper-partisanship. What's different now that we need to take very seriously is this used to be centered in the political system in Washington. Mm -hmm. In the 2016 election, as Americans watched writ large just the ugly language and the character assassination and bigotry and misogyny, etc., this has now seeped into us as the public and we've started to behave and feel like it's legitimate to still demonize, vilify, and even hate people who voted for the other candidate 10 months later. Political historians tell us that hasn't happened in the United States since Reconstruction. So in terms of what we're about here, we now have to figure out some way, how do we bring people back together in terms of a capacity to listen to one another to understand why did my life experience bring me to vote for this person? Your life experience brought you to vote for that person. If we don't learn how to do that, on one level, we are stuck in a way that it almost doesn't matter who wins the election next because we are so divided ourselves as the American people. You brought up something that I wanted to bring up. Um, I was in Florida for 2000, I covered the recount. And people were angry um, on both sides, but we moved on. And there were people who referred to President Bush as the, the resident of the United States and said he wasn't the legitimate winner and all those things, but there, there wasn't the anger. Uh, the day after the election in November, I read a story, it may have been even here in Arizona, about a woman who was so upset with her husband or boyfriend because he voted for the wrong candidate that she ran him down with a car. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're still seeing protests that involve tear gas and all kinds of things. Why is it that 10 months later, supporters of both candidates are still so strident and we're really not moving on? Is it just social media and all these things as you were saying, or is there something deeper going on? And that's to any of you or all of you. Partly, we all watched during an almost two-year period of time where candidates were treating each other as you spoke about, and we saw an upending of the social norm of civility where it's now been legitimized to in fact hold those feelings very, very tightly. And I think that's why it's still happening 10 months later. The social norm is now, it's okay to behave that way. And we know that none of us as parents feel that way. We know that none of us in our work settings feel that way. But at the Institute, we get calls, thousands of emails, frankly, where people are talking about, I have two daughters. They still don't talk to each other after this election. We get it about faith-based groups saying, this congregation was great for 30 years, and now it's like it's divided. And the biggest surprise to me, we've actually gotten calls from major corporations saying that still 10 months after the election, some of their most important product development teams, that's their future, or their project management teams, mm -hmm. lost so much trust in terms of who voted for who that their productivity is still not come back to a level point. One of the things that's different, of course, is that, well, in, in 2008, we were you know, getting away from the hourly news cycle. It was faster than that but it didn't have quite the same rapidity. And now um, we have a situation where we have media all the time. Everybody has a device to access the media that was going on all the time. And that media, I mean, does make a profit from, from conflict and tension. And so we're not able to have those moments where we can escape away from it and perhaps um, be more reflective and deliberative. Uh, we've changed in that, uh, 
We like to vent. I mean, how many times is vent used on social media or rant? Vent or rant. And, you know, before, there was more self-monitoring going on. And so people may have, you know, felt a certain level of anxiety, but it wasn't the kind of anger and anxiety that was primed constantly as it is today. Yeah, I think one of the consequences of sort of both of these um, phenomena is that increasingly Americans are able to um, are able to choose their political party based on their ideology. So liberals are much more likely to be Democrats now, and conservatives are much more likely to be Republicans. And as a result, you have this sorting going on among the American people that creates the tribalism that we see with parties. I mean, in 2000 was the first year that red and blue were used as colors to describe rep Republicans and Democrats. That was only 17 years ago. And now it's almost like team jerseys that people wear. It has become such a tribal social identity. With the, the social media and all of this anger we're all seeing on, on both sides, um, is it just a really loud minority or is it really the nation is, the majority of the nation, I, I won't say the nation as a whole, but the majority of the nation, or is it just a very vocal minority that is, that is very vocal? In terms of, we work a lot with elected officials, both at the state level and nationally. And what we hear from elected officials is that it's a minority on social media, mm -hmm. but they take up much more space. What I also think is interesting is now that there's some technologies to track even where the social media came from, many elected officials are actually reaching out and contacting the person who sent that message and nearly 100% of the time when they actually end up voice to voice with that person, this may be somebody who threatened their children on the, I mean, these are serious kinds of things, messages they're receiving, but almost to a person, the sender backs way off and said, well, you know, I was, I was heated in the moment. I, I don't really feel that way about you or your children. So it's more evidence as to what Kate was saying that the medium itself is encouraging people to behave out of their worst self and to, as you said, be totally reactive rather than any moment of reflection and a belief that is anybody going to see that it was me that said this. And isn't there a level of anonymity? I mean, mm -hmm. some people use their names, some people don't use their names, so there's a level of anonymity also. I feel like we've, we've um, we're starting to switch where, I think that was origin originally true, where anonymity does, does cloak a lot. But at the same time, because our information channels are so flooded, that I think people um, are willing to put quite a bit out there, claim that it's in the heat of the moment, and feel okay about it because there's probably another thousand people who've done something similar in the torrent of messages that are put out there. No, but I do think the medium does contribute somewhat. I mean, I found in my research that when you bring Democrats and Republicans together face to face, they have extremely productive bipartisan Absolutely. conversations. They come out of it enjoying talking to the other party, which a lot of people can't even imagine. Yeah. It's, so I think having this distance really does contribute to a lot of the hostility. Structurally, I just had to add to that, um, some of my colleagues and I have done some research on focus groups where we have um, students watch um, as, a, as a more liberal group, conservative groups, and mixed groups, um, documentaries like 2016. And we do find that when people have this opportunity to watch something and process it together, mm -hmm. um, the, the conversation is much more civil because it is face-to-face. -face. And so maybe, maybe that does lend itself to a little bit of calm, a little bit more reflection before you, you put it out there and it's away from your body working our way towards the idea of trustworthy and truthful. Um, is social media and, and cable news and, and even, I know there are people out there who still listen to the radio, thank you very much. Um, no matter what you're listening to, thank you for listening to the radio. Um, are we now more and more just focusing through our social media networks and what we watch and how we get information in an echo chamber where mm -hmm. you, know, you watch Fox News, you watch MSNBC or, or whatever, so you just keep hearing these things reinforced where we don't 
when many of us you know, were, were growing up, there were only three networks and one newspaper in town, and that's it. So is that part of the change? Absolutely. Uh, there's some fantastic apps out there. One is Pollet Echo. And what it allows you to do is if you use Facebook, it'll d basically diagnose uh, what your network looks like and how blue and red it is and in between based on what people inside your network um, read and listen to. And so it, very much, we know that people gravitate towards other people who are like them. They feel that they're getting a broad swath of the American public because their networks might be relatively large, have a couple hundred people. Um, so it feels like different sources of information, but really the arguments that are coming across are, are fairly similar. I want to put in an ad right now. Remember uh, Slido.com, you can download that app to get us questions and use hashtag SBS downtown. Um, and we've got people who are handling the questions. And uh, so you all can join our conversation coming up here talking about moving towards trust. If the media isn't trusted, fake news, and politicians aren't trusted for years, uh, the last few years we've seen Congress has single digit approval levels, but we still get in incumbents reelected. Um, who, who do we trust to get information? I mean, we as a society not necessarily, you know, listen to our station, which you all should, but, uh, <laughs> you, you know, who, who do we trust as a society now? So Gallup Poll has been doing that survey ever since World War II. And as you said, all, all institutions have been dropping, dropping, dropping. In the last time they did this poll, there was only one institution, and when I say this, it's even a question mark, I think, if it's an institution. But there was only one that was still above 50%. And it was at 51%. And it was interpersonal relations. So it was still that I'm likely to continue to trust this, if I have a relationship with you, that we have proven trustworthy to one another. And I think if that erodes much further, where we're actually not even willing to take at face value what people we're interacting with, then this sort of shift or drift toward authoritarianism, toward a looking for a source that reassures us when we basically are not trusting any institutions or even each other, it's a very dangerous place for a democracy to be. Yeah, I think that's one of the most troubling parts of sort of the partisan sorting that's been going on in the American public. Evidence shows Americans are more likely to say they wouldn't want their child to marry somebody of the opposing party. They wouldn't want to work with somebody of the opposing party. And this all points to decreasing interpersonal trust between partisans. And this is something new that we're seeing, that our feelings towards elites or political candidates is now being, sort of being placed on the people around us, our neighbors who might disagree with us politically. Can trust be rebuilt or have we gotten to the point, other than the 51%, but for everything else, that that trust will, cannot be rebuilt? Trust it, definitely can re be rebuilt. Uh, I never will forget a, a quote from a manager in Fish and Wildlife Service that we worked with many years ago, who said, you know, trust is lost by the ton. Trust is rebuilt by the thimbleful. And I think that's the challenge, that once it's been broken, of, yes, thank heavens, it can be rebuilt, but it takes time and it takes consistency in terms of that I do what I said I would do. And, and I think it takes um, honest self-reflection, which is what I think is lacking in a lot of people, maybe, maybe at the, well, I would say most of us, um, because we are so at the moment used to expression over that deliberation. Uh, when I have the opportunity to talk to different groups and I talk about things that we've, we've talked about um, so far, you know, about you know, incivility, about trust, um, it comes across that a lot of people afterwards will say, yeah, I have this friend. And the point is it's not always your friend that's the problem <laughs> <laughs> or you know, brother-in-law, whatever it is, not always the problem. Sometimes it's within and it is really hard to look within and acknowledge the kinds of biases we have. But until we do that kind of self-reflection, um, we're gonna have a really hard time trying to see things from someone else's perspective. Yeah, I agree. I mean, one of the things that I've found uh, sort of in researching um, the way people feel about 
politics and political candidates is that everybody says that they want candidates to compromise. They want more bipartisan trust, bipartisan cooperation, and we see that among Democrats and Republicans. But we also find, and I found this mostly with a series of experiments where respondents don't quite understand what I'm trying to get at, they do not respond positively when they find out that their party is compromised. Democrats and Republicans are equally likely to believe that compromise means the other party compromises. Compromise means the other party is going to give up on their values. And both parties are equally guilty of this. So I think it's exactly what you're talking about. People are very quick to blame the other party and really hesitant to see how they may actually be part of the problem. <laughs> is trust tied to civility or are the two ex exclusive of each other? I see them very much tied because as, as I've said, when, when we see opposing partisans together in social situations and they begin to trust each other, I think that is how civility is built. You're civil to the people that you trust and it, there's sort of a, I, I think it goes hand in hand. Yeah, I would agree with that. One of the things, we have an initiative now that we call Revive Civility and Respect and we're focusing very deeply in four states, Maine, Ohio, Iowa, and Arizona. And we just launched recently in Maine, and a story comes to mind that I think makes your point. When we do these workshops, what we do is really ask people to spend some time talking with someone who for them would be a very unlikely conversation. And the workshop that we first did, uh, I happened to recognize that the chairman of the Republican Party of that county in Midcoast, Maine, and the chairman of the Democrat Party in that county in Midcoast, Maine, were in the room. To, and when I put this challenge out to talk with someone that you wouldn't usually talk with, these two gentlemen chose that time to really converse with one another. And it built the conversation, was very civil. They actually agreed to have lunch together the next week. And out of that lunch, Maine is going to have a very tough gubernatorial race in 2018, and Maine had a governor that I'm even willing to say on public television was a Trump before Trump in terms of his behavior. <laughs> so it's going to be a very tough election. And these two party chairs over lunch said, you know what, let's talk with our committees and see if in Lincoln County we can set some standards for how candidates behave in this election. Let's see if we can cut this trend toward character assassination and continuous attack. So they have agreed to do this. So in a month or so, when we get together again, and we'll see how that's been working for the two of them, at NICD, our goal is to say, all right, let's find four other county chairs who would agree to do this and see if therefore it would be possible through that mechanism of the party itself to reestablish more civil behavior in the campaign, therefore increase the trust in the public in terms of what they're seeing. So we're pretty excited about that particular step. Right. Kate, you and I have talked, it seems, every two years, sometimes more often, about language in ads and things like that and, and communication strategies of candidates. H has it has the language in the ads become more uncivil, less trustworthy, or I'm sure if we, again, we talk to so many people out here, they'll say, oh yeah, political ads are always trustworthy. Uh, you know, you can always trust what the candidate is telling you in a 30 second paid spot. Um, has it changed? You know, I think it's almost hard to evaluate it because I think that when we've thought of, of something that's trustworthy or deceptive in the past, there would have been some sense of consensus across the political spectrum about what that would mean. And what we're seeing now is an environment that is um, very focused on supporters from one side. And we have an unfortunate situation where we're not agreeing upon basic underlying foundations, so facts. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is if we don't have the same base of facts, it's really hard to sort out how we apply values to facts. And so I guess I'm gonna punt on that one. Is it, is it more uncivil? Um, I think a couple things is to say, you know, incivility, in a sense, to some extent, is in the eye of the beholder. Um, I think we have some, some previous norms of what we thought it meant, but the problem is, is those norms have quickly disintegrated 
And so we do find that different types of people time, time, find different types of statements uncivil. Um, so it's, it's, it's within the person. Um, we know some things, that we know that generally speaking, if you have some kind of statement, which would not be in an ad because it, it wouldn't get passed and no legitimate campaign would do this, but, but, but vulgarities, I mean extreme vulgarities, I guess I should say, I might have to refine. <laughs> um, <laughs> those types of things, generally speaking, people agree that when someone says something, it's uncivil, um, they probably agree with that, but in different types of forums, um, they might not necessarily be mad at it. So in the past, we could probably agree that this person does not meet a set of, of professional standards for either party. And now, depending on your point of view, um, you'll see the other side or your own candidates and what you allow out of their behaviors uh, very different. And so uh, because it's so fractured, it, it's, it's hard to answer that question. I'm going to prove that we're taking questions from the audience uh, and, and go to a question. And uh, this one is interesting. It's, it's, I actually recognize this person. It's a, um, for those of you who have been around SBS, it's someone named Lydia. And, and this is a, a question from overseas where she is right now and uh, obviously watching the stream. And she said, our electoral politics affects also our relationships abroad. What should we tell our international friends about our future? <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Thank Lydia. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure anybody's going to touch this one, Lydia. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to support what Lydia is saying, the, there's a the world's second largest communication PR firm, Weber Shandrick, has done a Civility in America survey seven years in a row. And when they did the last survey, the data was collected in December of 2016. And apropos what Lydia was saying, two things, many things stand out, and this is up on the web that you all could look at. But 75% of Americans said that they now believe incivility is a crisis in our country. And 72% of Americans said that they really felt that the level of incivility in our politics was decreasing our standing in the world. So I think this is a tough time to be an American in another country and try to s explain what has happened to our political discourse and how that is impacting both us and because of who we have been in the world for so many decades, the impact that's having in other countries. I think it's a very serious issue. Another question here, and this, this could be the, uh, one of the big questions of the night. How do we measure trust in politics? That <laughs> seems like it's a bit of a subjective, uh, subjective thing, trust. How do we measure this? I think that's one of the hardest questions that we as political scientists who are interested in this, in this topic have to grapple with because it, you know, the only way to sort of measure it over time is to, to quantify it somehow. And that's sort of a lot of the work that I've been doing with, with colleagues recently is asking uh, people in Washington, D.C., asking elites, how, how do they know that trust has gone down in D.C.? And the answers that we were given is that we spend less time together, we have fewer social interactions, we have fewer discussions that aren't related to work, especially among political elites. So I think people tend to conceive of trust as sort of these casual interactions that we have in our day-to-day -day lives. And unfortunately, it appears as though Democrats and Republicans within the mass public are spending less time together socially. They are living in segregated neighborhoods. There, there is some evidence that people appear to be self-segregating based on politics. They are less likely to want to spend time together. Their kids are less likely to meet if they're going to different types of schools. And so I think these are sort of the signs people turn to when they're looking at interpartisan trust. I think but, the other thing that a lot of members would say is that another indication is how much true bipartisan legislation is passing. Mm -hmm. And they would refer to an earlier decade or two relationships like Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy or the current one that I would give the kudos to are Patty Murray and Lamar Alexander, who even in this profoundly high partisanship have managed to put several education bills through at a time when almost nothing else was passing. That, on that, that theme, and it was, um, it was a, a few years ago, but the Annenberg Public Policy Center um, put out um, a study 
where they looked at how much legislation was passed and they looked at um, how many takedowns were happen happening on the floor of Congress as a measure of incivility. And so a takedown happens when someone in Congress says something egregious on the floor and the par parliamentarian holds the process and there's some, some negotiations that happen behind the scenes and essentially the congressional record gets purged of that incident. And so we don't exactly know what happened in all those incidents. Um, we could go back now that everything's recorded more often, but they, they have these, this uh, history of takedowns. And you know, what we know is, is that when takedowns go up, um, less gets done. You know, this conversation brings something to mind that isn't exactly on point to your question, but I think it's important for people to know. In this last seating of the new session of Congress, in the House of Representatives, there were 52 new members. And of those 52 new members, 46 of them actually signed a commitment to civility. And it was 26 Republicans and six, or 28 Republicans and 16 Democrats, 20, 18 Democrats, just about matching what the R's and D's are in the House. And this is a very, very strong statement. This is not anything about being nice. This is <laughs> literally in the first paragraph they say, the, the vitriol in political rhetoric has really destroyed, that might be a stronger verb than they used, the public's trust in the institution of Congress. And it's our responsibility to do something to build that back. And, and again, this is a way in which the media is also implicated in this. This is a pretty radical thing to have happened in the House of Representatives, but nobody knows it. Mm -hmm. It was not covered in any way. We started interviewing those members that signed it, and the theme that came through in every one of those interviews was that as they were running for Congress, the public, the people whose votes they were trying to get were saying to them, we've had enough. This has gone too far. Both we really need the major problems to be solved, but we also need you to treat each other reasonably. It's a pretty interesting change. Have we gone back and looked 10 months into this Congress if those who signed it are, are still believing what they signed? Great question. And there's some good evidence and there's some challenging evidence. The good evidence is almost every one of those people have done something in the subcommittee that they have a role in where they have taken a stand with a member from the other party. So they've actually begun to work in that way. The bad news is, given what this Congress has been dealing with, particularly on health care, they all kind of fell back to their camps. You know, I'm probably the only person in America who could say this, but I actually sympathize with the politicians in this case. I agree. Because, as I've said, voters are not actually rewarding candidates who engage in compromise. And ultimately, it's a democracy, and it's up to the voters. Mm -hmm. And you can understand that as long as voters are going to stop voting for the person who compromises, why would a candidate ever engage in bipartisan reform in the first place? So I think that it's, it really is up to... Americans to vote for the people who compromise and to punish those who don't. But we see that again in both parties where people refuse to do it. So I, I think it's, in, it's great that candidates are taking that step. I just hope the can that voters are supporting them for doing it. Part of what we have to look at, though, is part of the place that that's playing itself out are in the primaries. Yes, absolutely. And in the primaries, very few people vote. Yeah. And in the primaries, it is the deep, deep partisans. Right. So I don't actually think in general Americans are punishing their elected officials for making compromises. Well, they are They're by not punishing. voting in the primaries. <laughs> That's a pretty sophisticated right. second step. <laughs> but yes, it would be a good thing for people to vote in primaries. <laughs> a couple of questions have come up, something I wanted to bring up also. Um, we used to, in elections, trust the ballot count. It seems like we don't trust even the ballot count anymore. Um, we heard lots of accusations of voter fraud uh, following the November election. I know we as an organization, Arizona Public Media, looked into a lot of it, couldn't find any in Arizona, but talked to election officials, said, oh, we've been hearing this for years. But this time it just seemed louder and more strident. If we can't trust the ballot count, how can we trust the rest? 
anybody? How do we? So I haven't it? seen data actually. Maybe you have, Kate, on the percentage of people who actually believe that voter fraud took place. But I imagine it's largely divided on partisan lines based on the fact that you know the, the Republican president was making these claims, and mm -hmm. people tend to agree with whatever candidate of their party says. Uh, but I'm not sure if, if Rasmussen did a poll. Rasmussen did this poll, and you're right; it did it did part on party lines. But even in that context, it was only about 27 percent, if I remember right, mm -hmm. that actually believed. Now that, in terms of what the deep studies of this, probably most recently done by Pew, mm -hmm. in looking at all of the data from the entire United States, it's just an infinitesimal number of actual instances of voter fraud that have happened. And just in case anyone thinks that's partisan, not only does Pew come out with that data, but also the Heritage Foundation, which is a very conservative think tank. So in terms of people who are looking at the data, there's really wide agreement that this is just not the kind of issue that's always been with us. This question gets raised continually, but it did reach a level of cacophony this time around that did take people into very strange behavior at polling places in terms of trying to prove voter fraud. But I mean, I think we've already covered, I mean, we've already mentioned a few things that the vast majority of Americans believe. The vast majority of Americans believe that incivility is a huge problem. The vast majority of Americans trust the voting process. So there actually is a lot of opportunity for trust and interpartisan cooperation. I think it again comes down to what Kate started talking about, which is that we don't see that when we, when we turn on the news. That's not what we hear about. Yep. What we yep. hear about are those 20% of people who believe that there was voter fraud or those 10% of people who aren't bothered by incivility. And I think that's really, that leads to a lot of the image problems that we have overseas to answer Lydia's question. Yes. <laughs> I do think, to, sorry. Say, oh, I, I was just gonna say, I think one thing to keep in mind is that sometimes when you see results from polls that, that look um, very intense about a person or a situation. Occasionally, the beliefs about that are more people agreeing with the sentiment, but not the facts behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so, a few years ago, uh, when there were polls about uh, the birther question, uh, there was some evidence to suggest that number you know, fluctuated over time and a, a couple pollsters said, you know, it's really someone expressing their anger at Obama, not necessarily. I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, it comes down to like, you know, high school gossip when someone spreads a rumor about someone and everyone jumps on it. Um, so it's, it's, you're, you're agreeing with the sentiment, um, but not necessarily the fact. And that makes for a very messy situation when we're the, our best, one of our best tools to understand what's going with the, on with the public is what they express, self-report in public opinion polls. I mean, we see that even. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we, we see that even with more basic facts. So for example, Republicans and Democrats tend to disagree about very basic facts like the unemployment rate or whether the economy has gotten better or gotten worse. So if we have a Republican in the office, Democrats will say the economy is not doing as well. If we have a, a Democrat in the office, Republicans will say that. And political scientists have actually offered respondents money to answer these questions accurately. And when they're given an incentive to actu ac actually answer it accurately, then that gap shrinks a lot. Exactly. They'll say, okay, fine, the economy is doing well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's exactly as Kate is saying, people are trying to express their opinions by supporting or opposing these factual statements. So I want to go back a minute to your real question about voters' trust in the actual vote itself. I do think we have crossed another line in this last election. And what I'm about to share is anecdotal, but we do a tremendous amount of work with the public. And we are hearing in red states and blue states and purple states that a lot of folks are really saying, you know, we need to go to have a paper trail for every vote. And that I should end up with a piece of paper after I leave the election, as well as the election authorities should, so that we can actually verify that what happened in the computer system is the same as the vote that I made. So the combination of all those questions and the issues surrounding Russian hacking, I do think there is an angst about the accuracy of the count of the vote that is different than has been true previously. Let me change topics a little bit, but again, going to our, our, our audience here for some of the questions. With all of the lack of trust of our elected officials from those of us who are not elected officials and elected officials of each other, 
are we setting ourselves up for the emergence of a new party, a third party that could eventually replace one of our current parties? Good job, whoever asked that. You stunned them. Very good. <laughs> I think Carolyn's probably the most equipped to answer this one because it is such a structural question. I mean, there's so many institutional barriers for that to happen. So, Not to set you when, up, Carolyn. No, 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 Carolyn no, has no, a great no. answer for that. <laughs> so many of you in the audience, like myself, are old enough to remember exactly what I'm going to say, is that the first in modern politics, the first serious run of an independent candidate was John Anderson in 1980. Within six months of that election, both parties, 38 states, had passed laws that made it much more difficult for a third party to emerge. So as you just said, the way the legal structure is set up state by state, it is very nearly impossible for an independent candidate to amass enough votes the first time around that means they don't have to start completely over again back to the raising whatever the number of hundreds of thousands of signatures it is to get on the ballot itself. So there may be a sorting of our values and there may be a sorting of where that would go in terms of policy directions that makes it seem like a third party should emerge in the country, but structurally it would be extremely difficult for that to happen. I mean, I think this recent election was the best opportunity for a third party that we've seen in a long time. We had two candidates who are historically disliked. Both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were very, very unfavorable among their own parties. That was probably the best shot we had for a third party. But Americans, when they vote, are very concerned with electability. That's one of the biggest concerns that comes up through, through the primaries. Yeah, I like the guy, but is he really electable? Or, you know, I think she's really smart, but I just don't see her having a chance of winning. That's the biggest barrier for these third party candidates, to really convince people that they can win. And I think that was the biggest barrier for Bernie Sanders, and he did an incredible job convincing people that he was electable. And it's the barrier that Donald Trump faced as well. And as we all know, not only did he prove he was electable, but he, he ultimately won. So, you know, it's possible, but it's very difficult if you don't align with a major party. And anecdotally, I've heard that over years of reporting on primaries where you'll have a, an incumbent facing a challenger, usually f depending on which part of the incumbent is, from the far right or far left, and the challenger seems to be doing very well. But come election day, the incumbent walks away with it. And talking to voters as they leave, it's always, well, I thought the incumbent would do better in the general. I wanted to make sure the party, whichever they were, you know, maintained the seat, that kind of thing. So. so another element here that when we think specifically about 2016 that we really need to name is this is the first presidential election where we've really seen the impact of Citizens United. Mm -hmm. And we're now in a place where if you as a candidate have one multimillionaire or one billionaire backing you, you can stay in the race for a long time. Believe me, the Republican Party would never have allowed, if they could have that influence still, 17 candidates to be running way into March of 2016. So that dynamic is really in the mix in terms of what it makes it possible for someone to win elections mm -hmm. now. Going back to audience questions, uh, there's a question here that says authoritarianism is becoming a looming threat in American democracy. This was mentioned earlier in the conversation. How do we build demo rebuild democratic little d, democratic values? There's a big press in the country mm -hmm. for reestablishing civic education. Uh, sitting here in Arizona, Sandra Day O'Connor committed the, the end of her career when she left the Supreme Court to what's called iCivics, which I think is now available in something like 15,000 schools across the country. So I think a lot of people are stepping back to say one of the things we have to do is really bring back into education not just book learning about civics, but the actual experience of what are the range of activities that an active citizen partakes in. One of the things that has um, gone by the wayside in many school districts across the country um, is speech and debate. And I think going back to earlier points made about um, you know, people having the tendency to you know, trust themselves but not see things from other people's perspectives, one thing that speech and debate teaches you 
is that you, if, if you want to win the debate, and there is, there is sophistry in the exercise of, of <laughs> speech and debate, <laughs> but for that moment, you have to make the best arguments possible from the other side if you want to win the trophy. And one thing that's really great about that is it does allow people to see things from the other side. And yet, unfortunately, um, in a lot of high schools, uh, speech and debate programs are not you know, funded or encouraged like they were. And that there's some problems with how speech and debate admittedly are, are conducted um, today. But I think that if there was an infusion of interest in that and people were willing to have their kids occasionally argue for the other side, <laughs> we'd be much healthier overall. That's a well good point. Said. <laughs> well said. You know, there is also some work showing, and you know, this is a, a little controversial, but the ability to just like something on Facebook or to share something on Twitter has really decreased people's willingness to do anything beyond that. So you can share articles or email them to your friends or like a candidate's Facebook page and say, all right, I did my civic duty today. Good for me. Um, I'm, a, I'm an active citizen. And those sort of passive, I think the the term that's been thrown out is political hobbyism, where it's just yeah. sort of a hobby, it's something you like to do, but it takes away this need to actually show up to the town hall meeting or even to demand that there be a town hall meeting held in the first place. So I think that that may also contribute to the sort of laziness a little bit in terms of how active we are civically. Well, that's nice. You played right in. I, I didn't realize you could see the question yes. also. <laughs> Thanks for it's playing reading. right in. Um, Voter apathy seems to be, we're getting lower turnouts uh, than we've had in the past, um, especially for off-year elections. Does this play into loss of trust, loss of civility, and all the things we've been talking about? And before we answer, let me remind everybody that we have a city of Tucson election coming up. Ballots are out in the mail. Please remember to vote. With that said, <laughs> Does voter apathy um, play into all of this? It is pretty stunning that we are the country that first put into our founding documents a deep belief in universal suffrage, and we know back then that didn't include any of us, and <laughs> it didn't include some people who were a different color, but we've made phenomenal progress over two plus centuries. And yet, when you look at elections now, about 40% of us do not vote on a regular basis. And if you compare that to other industrial nations around the world, we rank at about 28th, I think just behind Estonia, in terms of what's the percentage of people that actually participate. And yet I really recoil against the, and I know you are the person who said it, didn't mean it that way, but how we have generally looked at that is as it's apathy on the part of that voter. And we have tended to blame people for not voting, as opposed to really listening to why they don't vote. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find is that people usually have a pretty meaningful rationale for why they don't vote. I live in a district in Oklahoma that has never elected anything but a Republican. Why should I bother to vote? My vote doesn't make a difference. It's a very common, or mm -hmm. I'm not picking on Oklahoma, we could have picked any other <laughs> state and a lot of other districts. Uh, recently in Atlanta, I asked, I was in a conversation initiated by an African American driver and just what he was saying, I finally said to him, I said, well, I really hope you will vote. And he literally turned around in the cab and looked at me and said, no, I don't intend to vote until these deal issues of oppression are dealt with in our society. So people have real reasons for not voting. I'm now going to jump to make what is a quite radical statement. I actually think we should think seriously about going to what 38 other countries in the world do, which is that we should require people to vote. We require people to have driver's licenses. We require people to have... Mm -hmm. And I know I'll, I, could, I could take the other side and I could be from the ACLU and I could say all the reasons this will never happen in the United States. But frankly, it's amazing to be in another country that has that law. Mm -hmm. My first experience of that was in Australia in 1981. And virtually every person I met, no matter what the context were, they knew who the candidates were and they were talking about the election. And the barrier that's built there is you either vote or you spend a night in jail or pay a $50 <laughs> fine. 
And Australia, in listening closely to their people, has made only one change in that law since that year. And the change in that was to always put on the ballot, there's candidate A, mm -hmm. candidate B, and I don't support either of those candidates. Right. So that you can register that, yes, I'm registering my voice and my voice is, as would have been done by many people in 2016, yeah. neither of these candidates are acceptable to me. Yeah, or I mean, even a simple change, and I'm trying to remember the reason, but why do we vote on a Tuesday? There is a reason for it. It's something about like the there harvest the or something yeah. back in the, maybe somebody here knows, but why is it not on a weekend? Why is, it, why is it not a holiday? There are so many people who are single parents, who are hourly workers, who practically cannot take time off on a random Tuesday in November to go to the ballot. I mean, these very simple structural things could dramatically increase turnout. Of course, the argument on that is now we have so much early voting and mail-in voting and things yeah, like that. Yeah, that's that true. It, and that is helping. That is helping. It out. Yeah. It, it's interesting you bring up Australia. <laughs> um, they have either just had or are about to have an election, and it's one of the few that is not mandatory hmm. and it is not binding. What's interesting is the topic is on... Um, on, on gay rights um, and gay marriage, and it's a non-binding national election. Interesting. So it, it's fascinating to see the way they've played with their law uh, on that one. But it'll also be interesting to see what percentage of people vote. It'll be mm -hmm. very interesting yeah. to see. So just uh, one thing, just backing up to the, the broader topic of you know, participation, um, and actually knowing what you're doing, because there is a, a, a tension there. and. There's some research to suggest that you know, during times people have been most expressive and participated the most, it has been because it's been rah-rah for their party. And when things get muddled and are really hard, then the rates go down. And so there, I just wanted to put out there that there's that tension between deliberation and participation. And that people participate doesn't mean that they'll, they'll necessarily have the information to make an informed decision. And so the tensions out there. And so if some system would be changed, would, a lot, of course, would have to go into mm -hmm. how do we make people, you know, competent voters? Is it just the candidates that are the compelling items? Or is there something more that we can do? When it comes to paid media ads, do we all say we hate negative advertising? All the polls say voters hate negative advertising. Professionally, I love it because it gives me work uh, to break down the negative ads. Me but either. do we <laughs> see um, that that has an effect, those negative types of ads, of driving people to the polls or people just throwing up their hands and saying, forget it, I'm not voting for either of these people? Every election's a little bit different um, in terms of what the research has found. But, but overall, if you were to look at it, it's that messages are out there that compels people, not necessarily the negativity. I think it's also important to keep in mind that negativity is, is, is a difficult concept because there are some truths that are important to democracy inside something that's a negative statement. And so um, what might make more sense is us to talk about like illegitimate kinds of you know, uncivil, uncalled for claims versus those that are attacks, um, but do get at the heart of issues that voters need to be aware of. I lived in Ohio for 20 years, and Ohio is probably the most true swing state in the country. So in every presidential cycle, literally hundreds of millions of dollars drop into that state for this negative blitz of campaigning at the end. And people are sick of it. Journalists are sick of it. Everybody's sick of it. So a project that we engaged in in 2015 in Ohio brought together 60 people, 20 journalists, 20 citizen leaders, and 20 elected officials. And the strongest theme that came out was they were nervous about what was gonna happen in 2016. So they banded together to say, is there anything we could do to change the kind of coverage that happens during the presidential campaign? And 14 outlets, some television, they were the hardest to convince because of all the money that comes to television for those ads, radio, internet, and print, agreed to start with a very deep dive in polling that was done by the Ray Bliss Institute at the University of Akron, 
where they took the eight top issues that Ohioans said they cared about in the presidential election, and they asked the public, okay, on jobs, on immigration, what do you want to hear from the candidates? And these 14 outlets agreed that every time a candidate came to the state of Ohio, whether it was a Sunday morning talk show or an editorial board, that the journalists would agree to actually start with the questions of the citizens. They called it citizen-centered journalism. And not let the candidates talk about their pre-canned positions until after they had responded to each of these, the questions that came from the public. This project was so successful in terms of the people who understood what was happening, both the public and the journalists, that a gentleman named, uh, oh Lord, I've said that and now forgotten his name at the moment. He was the, the managing editor at the Akron Beacon Journal. And he actually has resigned his position. A couple of fellowships have been put together. Now 25 journalistic out outlets are already signed on, and the project is called Ohio Voices. And you should look it up on the web because it's very interesting of where a real collaboration between the public and journalists are trying to push back about what dominates the airwaves in terms of how candidates and politicians present themselves to the public. Interesting. Uh question here from the audience. Do you think that there was more at stake for this past election than others, and that's what affected the hostility on both sides and this far after the election? I would say, I would say no. I don't think it ha it, it, it's that there was more at stake. I really do think it came out of the nature of the campaigns. And I agree. The sort of retrospective content analyses of both campaigns shows that both campaigns were historically more negative than any campaign before. I don't know if the Clinton campaign set out to do this, but they ultimately had a campaign largely based on personal attacks against Donald Trump. And Trump had some of the most shocking language in his campaign that people had seen in previous campaigns. So I really think a lot of the hostility came from the, the tone that was set really by by both campaigns to a large degree. I would say that um, every election is the most important election ever. <laughs> and so it's hard for me to say that, that this moment in time was so much more important than, than previous ones. Um, our present is the most important. Similar to what Samara said, um, we were invited to do some standards for the general election debates in terms of how candidates should behave, how moderators should behave, and how the audience should behave. And our research director turned that into basically a scorecard that you could watch the debate and score the debate while it was going on. And then we also had some graduate students actually look at the video of every single presidential debate all the way back to Nixon and Kennedy. And this is, this is an example also about how things get normalized people sort of began to say that the, what happened during the general election debates wasn't that different than what had happened before. When in fact, if you just go back to Obama and Romney and to Obama and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, McCain, literally in the Romney-Obama debates, the sort of most sort of attacking kind of language that was used was, oh, did he just tell a whopper? Well, that's some <laughs> distance <laughs> from what we observed in the Trump-Clinton debates in terms of behavior on stage, not just verbal, but physical as well. So this 2016 election was something we haven't seen before. One thing, and this is just in terms of Twitter, um, to keep in mind is that predominantly what candidates do on Twitter, Twitter is talk about themselves. And so I know that there's this perception that social media can be a, a truly awful place. Um, but it only takes, I guess, one uh, compelling, uncivil tweet to get a lot of coverage. If you look at what the candidates are actually putting out, um, it's very self-centered. It's a very self-centered medium about what they've done in this moment. And so whereas camp, you know, statements you know, may be um, negative, you know, Twitter, Again, a lot of it's about the self. It's about self-advocacy. Here's a, one of our philosophical questions for the night. Comes from our audience. Where is our nation headed if this heavy division between political parties continues? 
Well, I tend to be fairly optimistic just as a person, so maybe I should start you off with that before we get too dark. <laughs> I do think that there is very wide consensus that people are sick of this tone, and I think it will change. I mean, I, Americans do tend to shift. We see this with ideology. When the government becomes a little too conservative, all Americans of both parties tend to prefer a little more, some more liberal policies. When the government moves a little more liberal, all Americans tend to prefer something more conservative. So we see these shifts over time. So I do think that ultimately both parties are going to begin to reward candidates who, who speak in a more civil manner, who represent their more moderate views. And we know that Americans are relatively actually very moderate ideologically. As much as they tend to have identify sort of on the extreme as strong Democrats or strong Republicans, there is quite a bit of overlap ideologically that we don't hear that much about. So I, I think there is, is a lot of potential for people to start to reward the candidates who represent them in that way. I completely agree. Both, I also am very optimistic, <laughs> but what we see in the community conversations that we're doing is this is popping up all over the country where people of their own accord who are, have had enough. Um, an example, again, we were just in Maine, a gentleman has started something called makeshift coffee houses. And they go from one community to another community where they invite people who are on two sides of these chasms to come together for an evening, share a cup of coffee or tea, and have a conversation with the person who thinks differently than you do. And we see these stories all over. It's another, it's a real problem in terms of our national narrative never actually lets us see mm -hmm. how much positive movement is happening in reaction to what happened last year. So I too think we will come out of this. I don't think it will happen quickly. I think once you've broken a social norm, the amount of time it takes to build it back is much more extensive than it takes to tear it down. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be in it for the long haul, but I think we'll get there. De Tocqueville said about us in 1837 that not only did we give the gift of some enlightened perspective on what governing should be, but that we had the capacity to write ourselves. And I think we'll see that again. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll be the devil's advocate. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can see my glass is uh, half, more than half empty. <laughs> uh, I guess my concern, and I do agree we have this potential. Uh, to, we have the, the, the potential to change things if we desire and to do that internal self-reflection. Agreed. But almost everything in our environment is operating against that, and that's a problem. Um, my concern is that we wear down our impressions of the parties to such low degrees, and they're needed to some extent to mobilize, to create coherent-ish mm -hmm. platforms so that people understand what's going on, parties function that way. And to the extent that we have um, degraded both sides to such an extent, I'm concerned that we've worn away um, the norms and we're going to begin to really wear away the institutions and our respect for the institutions themselves. And so if we don't have more politicians on all sides standing up and going against their party when what they see in both sides, when they see something that's egregious, when they see behavior within their party that they think violates a norm that needs to be there for us to be our best selves, um, that then we're not going to get there. And I guess what I'm not seeing is, is quite enough politicians saying, you know what, I know that in this moment, for me personally, winning maybe what's what I'm thinking about, but I need to stand up for what's right. And I think both parties have things that are right, they feel is right. Sometimes winning isn't the most important thing. Sometimes standing up for something more is the important thing. And right now we need more politicians to stand up for the system. Mm -hmm. Well said. Agreed. You'll note that Samara's and I, optimism was about the people, not about <laughs> that. <laughs> Although in a sense, you know, every time that a politician does and I mean, if we want to focus specifically on the Republican Party, every time a Republican senator goes against, against the president, it is, a, it is a step. I mean, we are seeing that. In Arizona, yeah. we're seeing that particularly. So I think there are, we're seeing more moves more quickly than I think I would have predicted. 
Well, will we see, I mean, we see politicians standing up against the president. Let's stay in Arizona for a moment. Jeff Flake, uh, mm -hmm. one of our U.S. senators, stands up uh, to Donald Trump, and now he has a primary opponent, mm -hmm. one, and more may be coming. Can he win this? Will, will people reward him for standing up for, I, I believe the term used to be statesmanship, potentially, mm -hmm. um, or bipartisan action, um, or is he going to be a one-term senator, do you think, given today's climate? Mm -hmm. I think this comes right back to something we talked about before. It will depend on how many people in Arizona vote in that primary, mm -hmm. pure and simple. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the v voters will get what they want and what they deserve by, by coming out to either support him or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think someone in the audience was apparently sitting at a table next to us at dinner um, because there's a slightly off-topic question, but it was something we spent a lot of time talking about over dinner, and the topic is gerrymandering and, um, and also with districts being drawn that the, the way they're being drawn now, does that reduce the, the impact of the popular vote which then leads into the Electoral College and things like that. Uh, one of you, I'm pretty sure, was sitting next to us at dinner because we were talking about this. Mm -hmm. How does this play into trust, civility, and the future of elections? Well, in the House of Representatives, there are 435 districts, and they change every two years. And for quite some time, Charlie Cook Report is the one to watch closely on this. Only about 25, sometimes 27 of those districts are truly competitive. Mm -hmm. The rest of them are owned by the incumbent. And both parties have been guilty of this for many decades. It, the governor and legislature make the choice about the next boundaries that's set by basis on the, t on the basis of the census. So there isn't any question, but what gerrymandering has a profound impact on all of the issues that we've been talking about. The move in that case is to go to an independent commission, and I know Arizona's had a mixed experience with that. I happen to be a native Iowan. Iowa was the first state to go to a truly nonpartisan commission process for setting the districts, and it is a fact that Iowa has had more competitive districts in the House of Representatives since that happened on a per capita basis than any other state in the country. So the way to get involved to impact that is to join organizations that are dealing with that issue. Fair Vote is a very good one to link to nationally and who's, they're, they're also working on ranked choice voting, which has a huge impact on incivility in campaigns. It just means that you vote for your top two candidates and if no one gets more than 50%, Sorry to go beyond gerrymandering. It means there's a runoff between those two. And if you and I are from different parties, but we know we might end up in that runoff, we treat each other very differently. Mm -hmm. Another philosophical question. Uh, how would you, the panelists, start to heal the divides in American politics if you were in that position of power? I think the biggest thing we need to do and everybody here needs to do is to really stop demonizing individuals from the other party and everybody does it. You hear it colloquially amongst your friends when you're watching TV or you see bumper stickers on cars you don't agree with. I wish there was a way to institutionally do that. I do it with students because I have that position of power over them and I can force them to. Uh, but it's not <laughs> something that we can just do with, with the American public, but it really has such a huge effect. And I think Carolyn framed it so well at the beginning of this conversation by saying that some, your life brings you to a particular position to support a particular party. And so often, two people who support different parties actually do want the same thing. That hasn't changed. Maybe we agree on different facts or we may have different values in one way or another, but if there was some way to really encourage that, you know, assigned seating at the dinner table or something, uh, I think that would, that's the only way to do it. And I think everybody has the potential to do that, but it's very, very difficult to do in your own life. Uh, I would say a couple things. One is, as I've mentioned, um, that internal reflection. And there's some ways to do that. Um, one, of course, is make sure in your media diet you go to some alternative sources that you wouldn't normally read, even if you despise them. 
it can make you feel uncomfortable, but perhaps one of our problems is, is right now um, we've gotten too comfortable and we need to get out of our complacency and be a, uncomfortable for a, an occasion by reading an article or two from the other side each day. Other things that we can do, um, we can do things like take implicit attitude tests so that we can have a better understanding of what our biases are. So there's a project at Harvard called Project Implicit, and they have these tests online that measure people's attitudes on a wide variety of things. Race, um, gay rights, um, political ideology, religion, women in science. And where you think you are, if you were asked this question like directly, like, you know, you know, are you, if I were to ask you, are you sexist or racist, I'm guessing most <laughs> people would say no. <laughs> but what it does is, is it does a test where it's about how fast you associate words. And you can't really fool it quite like you can <laughs> fool a direct question. It's private. You get an assessment of where you're at, so maybe you have um, a more well-rounded understanding of yourself. The third thing, if I had power to do it, is I would make sure that we had vibrant speech and debate programs, um, ones in which our students at young ages got used to understanding different perspectives. Um, I'd also like to see, I was a little bit disappointed um, in uh, my children's elementary school uh, during the 2016 election um, because the kids weren't um, talking about politics. They didn't use that opportunity. I know it's I mean, horrible. I can see where a parent might get upset <laughs> if the candidate they didn't like um, or did like was being discussed in a way that they didn't want their ch children to hear. But I don't think protection is the answer. I think being confronted with things and making ourselves more resilient by understanding ourselves is the way to go. And I think if we did that, we'd have a, be in a much better position to understand why other people believe what they do. So this question is kind of the sweet spot for the National Institute of <laughs> Civil Discourse <laughs> because it's exactly what we're trying to do. And I would invite each and every one of you to actually go to our website www.revivecivility.org and the first step we ask you to take there is actually sign a pledge yourself in terms of the choices you're going to make about how you enter conversations and commit to civility. And then we invite you to invite other folks to do that and encourage small groups, could be one-on-one, -on -one, can be small groups, can be in large group in a community, actually take the risk of having a real conversation with someone in your life that in reality, in the last year, a distance has grown because of exactly what we've been talking about up here all night. It is not easy to do. Almost every one of us has a relative that we are more distant from than we were previous to 2016. <laughs> Many of us in the places that we choose to worship have seen a congregation that has been a close-knit community. Our kids do things together, we potluck together. We get tens of calls from ministers and priests and even imams who say, our congregation isn't the same since 2016. As I said before, places of business, people that you work with. So what we are inviting people to do, and I hope you'll do it even as I'm talking, think of the person in your life that you should take the risk to have an unlikely conversation with in exactly the principles we've been talking about. There's a risk and there's a reward and it will be scary and it will create some anxiety. What we hope we've done on this website is some support to if you were actually gonna do this, how do you support yourself to enter it where the agreement the two of you make, we are going to listen to each other only to understand how I came to hold the value or the view or the vote that I hold. We're not going to do anything to influence each other. We're not going to re... And then it's like, Kate, you've beautifully said the self-reflection. So when I'm listening to the other person, I start to track. Where am I having that emotional reaction? Where am I having that, uh, how could you think like that? Which then is my job to step back and say, well, how did I come to that judgment? And what you do at that moment is ask another question. I hope you'll all try it. You know, I had a friend in the 2008 election who told me that he always thought he was really open-minded when it came to politics, but he was taking his kids trick-or-treating. 
and his young kids did not want to trick or treat at homes with yard signs for the other candidate. Wow. And he realized that maybe there was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you may want to watch for that this Halloween if you're taking your kids out. But... Good news. We only have 39 more questions from the audience. <laughs> So I hope everybody's comfortable. We're going to try. Um, actually, unfortunately, we cannot get to them all. We are basically at the end. Um, and before I ask the last question, which is an audience question, which means we have 38 after that, um, I want to thank all of you for your time and your expertise. And I want to thank all of you for coming out and spending time and giving us some thought-provoking questions and maybe thinking about a few things that, are, uh, that were said tonight. So we'll end on another big philosophical question, and we'll just go right down the row. We'll start with Kate and work down this way. No pressure here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are your hopes for the next election? Are we talking midterm, presidential? <laughs> uh, let's go with midterm. Okay. We won't talk about the Tucson election that ballots went out for today. <laughs> uh, my hope is that people, despite, um, I think that uh, a constant uh, tension that's been going on with both parties, I think, uh, particularly with Trump because of his unconventional ways of doing things, and this is, I'm not, I think he, he operates differently than we've seen other presidents operate in the past, and I think that um, there's, there's some, some mixing, right, of, of how he operates and how we're interacting with it and then how we recalibrate ourselves, and what I would like to see is that people make sure that even if you're mad at your relatives or <laughs> whoever it is, um, that you don't shy away from politics and that um, as you're proceeding forward, you do your, your best. It's completely understandable when someone has a position that's antithetical to what you see as is, is yourself to be upset, but to figure out how to channel um, that frustration into something more productive. And um, what I see is a lot of people, you know, again, doing the expression, but I'd like to see more connection. And so I, what I think would be fabulous for um, 2018 for, for both sides is for people within parties and across parties, when they disagree, say, instead of, you're a liar, mm -hmm. even if you think the person is lying, because <laughs> I know that we use this word a lot now, um, both sides, it gets used. And, um, it's not, interestingly, it's not allowed on the floor of Congress, even if congressmen believe it. That's one of the things that a takedown will occur, because they know it inhibits communication. So instead of, that person lies, I'm not going to talk with them, or I'm not going to read that, to con um, convey, I disagree with you because, try to recap what you think they're saying, and then provide a rationale. It's difficult, it takes more time. But what I would love to see is to people embrace an exchange of ideas and make sure, despite on both sides of the spectrum, any tension that you feel, um, that we continue to move forward so that we can make sure that our society uh, is the best that it can be. Samara. Yeah, I, th I think the most important thing that I would love to see in upcoming elections is for people to participate, especially at the local level. Because I think it's really local candidates are where you see a lot of potential for different types of out-of-the-box candidates. Local candidates aren't as beholden to major parties. They're more willing to compromise. They're more likely to come up with sort of ideologically mixed platforms. But they, there's so little money in local elections, and there's so little interest, frankly. I think if, if people gave a lot more attention to candidates at the local level, supporting them, it would eventually... National candidates were once local candidates. So I think that that would actually probably help us down the road to engage more at the civic level. It's a great question. And what I'm struck by is how many people we've heard in the conversations that we're trying to help across the country already now in August, September, October of this year, talking about how afraid they are that the 2018 midterm election will be even worse than 2016. So what people have absorbed was that the degradation that we watched will now seem to be a norm and that it might even get worse. So my real hope for the 2018 election is that enough people have woken up and enough politicians have woken up and enough political consultants have woken up 
to how this trend is really degrading our democracy and decreasing our confidence in our institutions, that people will rise above it and take a different tact. And I think that does, exactly like you said, require more people to really be engaged, to speak up for what's right. It really harms us all to go through another election cycle with the kind of language and the kind of character assassination and the kind of bigotry that we watched literally for almost two years. We are better than that as a people, but the only way it will change is if we demand it. All right. With that, I turn it back over to the Dean. The Dean. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank everyone for coming tonight, and I want to thank uh, everyone on this great panel. We learned a great deal. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>